The Boy Who Hoped In a town called Bialystok, there was a boy called Ludwig Zamenhof. Ludwig was a Jew. There were many Jews in Bialystok. There were also Russians, Poles, and Germans. They all lived in different parts of the city, and they did not get on well. Ludwig grew up speaking many languages. He spoke Yiddish, Polish, and Russian, and learned Latin and ancient Greek in school. These dead languages gave him a headache, but everyone said they were important. Everything important is written in Latin, said his teacher. Ludwig did not agree with this. Dostoevsky did not write his books in Latin. The Torah was not in Latin. But still, he had to learn Latin. As Ludwig grew older, he became more interested in languages. His father, a teacher, taught him French, German, and Hebrew, and Ludwig fell in love with them. Suddenly he could see links between the different languages. The French word per is from the Latin pater, and the German vater is also similar. Isn't that interesting? He said these things to his mother and father, and they just laughed. Languages were to be used, not to be played with. One day, Ludwig was talking in the street with a Jewish friend. They were talking Yiddish, the language of the Jews. Normally he only spoke Yiddish at home, but he was very close with his friend. A man walked past them and heard that they were speaking Yiddish. He shouted something at them in Polish. He shouted and shouted and did not stop until Ludwig spoke to him in Russian. What do you want? He said. The man kept shouting, so Ludwig tried speaking in Polish. He did not know it well, but he had heard enough in the streets to say some words. What do you want? He repeated. The man said a word that Ludwig did know, a very nasty word, and walked away. What did that man say? Asked Ludwig's friend. Ludwig turned red. I do not want to repeat it. Ludwig went home and thought about what happened. Bialystok was a broken town. The Russians, Poles, Germans and Jews lived completely separate lives. When they did meet, they often fought. Ludwig began thinking, what if they all spoke one language? If everyone spoke one language, then they wouldn't shout at you in the street like that. If everyone spoke one language, then a Russian man could talk to a German man, just like an Englishman could talk to a Chinese man. But what language could it be? It couldn't be German, because then the Germans would have an unfair advantage. It couldn't be Russian, or Polish, or Yiddish, for the same reason. Ludwig had an idea. What if everyone spoke Latin? Latin did not belong to any one country anymore. He imagined traveling around, speaking Latin around the world. The next day, he went and told his friends his idea, and they laughed. Latin is too hard. 
Aren't you tired of it? Better that we all just learn French. But Ludwig wasn't happy with this. It was true, though. Latin was too hard. If everyone was going to speak one language, it needed to be easy. That night, Ludwig sat in his room and started writing. He wrote out sentences in French, German, Russian, Hebrew. He compared the grammar and thought about the rules. Why, in French, were there silent letters? Why, in German, did the verbs have to change according to the person? Why, in Russian, did there have to be a perfect and imperfect form of every verb? There were too many rules and irregularities. It could be much easier than that, he was sure. Ludwig started writing. He took words from French, sometimes mixing in some German or Hebrew, and made up his own grammar. The rules would be regular. They would be easy to learn. All verbs would have the same endings. And every letter would always be pronounced the same. Yes, that made sense, didn't it? Ludwig wrote and wrote, changing words, fixing rules, until his father came into the room. Ludwig, can't you hear? It's supper time. We've been calling for ages. Ludwig turned bright red and hid the paper he was writing on. Coming. Over the next few years, Ludwig worked on his language in secret. He did not tell anyone, because he was sure they would laugh at him. He wrote a grammar, sentences, and even some exercises. Finally, he couldn't keep hiding it. One day, he brought it to school and showed his friends. Ludwig, this is amazing. His friends loved his language. Every day, during break at school, Ludwig sat under a tree with his friends, teaching them how to speak his language. It was hard, because he still didn't know it well himself. Also, while he taught them he realized how he could make it better, so he changed some parts of it. On Ludwig's 18th birthday, his friends sat around his birthday cake, and sang the song in his language. It was a sad celebration, though, as Ludwig was going off to university, and wouldn't see his friends again for several years. Ludwig was going to study medicine, but really all he cared about was his language project, which he called the Universal Language. By now, he had written so many documents for it that he almost had a book. Before he left for Warsaw, his father spoke to him. Ludwig, I understand you care very much about this little project of yours. But you must understand. Medical school is not easy, and it is important that you get a good job so you can support your wife. I don't want you to get distracted while you're studying. I'm going to take your work and keep it here. Don't worry, it will be safe. When you graduate, I will return it to you. Ludwig was heartbroken, but he agreed, because he loved his father. He knew that he didn't approve of Ludwig's project, but he also knew that he could convince him of it. Ludwig went and studied, 
and he did not get distracted by his language. However, he did get distracted by a girl called Clara. Clara was beautiful and clever, and they got on very well. Clara did not laugh at him for his project. In fact, she thought it was a great idea. When Ludwig returned home from Warsaw, he was excited to pull out his work on the universal language. He had had many ideas at university, even though he tried to focus on studying, like his father said. But when he asked his father where it was, the man replied, Don't be silly, Ludwig. It's been years now. I can't remember where I put it. It doesn't matter, anyway. You are going to marry this Clara girl, yes? You'll be too busy to worry about a made-up language. Ludwig asked his mother, and discovered that his father had not kept his documents, but had instead burned them. Ludwig was shocked, and almost gave up on his project. But Clara told him not to. You can start again. You wrote it before. It's all there, in your head. So Ludwig got to work. To his surprise, it was all there in his head. Even after years of studying, he had not forgotten. But now, having been away from it, he could see the problems in his language. So he did not write it out from memory, but rewrote it, making it better in every way. After a few months' work, he had rewritten all of the documents, but this time he was much happier with the results. Ludwig and Clara moved back to Warsaw and got married soon after, and Ludwig received a dowry of 5,000 rubles from Clara's father. It was enough to make sure they could start a life together comfortably. But Ludwig had other ideas. Now that I have finished my language, he said, I must share it with the world. And I cannot just go out into the streets and tell people about it. I must publish a book. It was not a cheap thing to do, but before Ludwig could say another word, Clara said, use the dowry. We can manage without it. Ludwig was amazed at his new wife's belief. Truly, she was perfect for him. She had already started learning the new version of the universal language, and she had already told all her friends about it. So Ludwig put together a book. It had to be short, because publishing was expensive. He reduced the grammar of the language into 16 rules, and he was surprised to find that, in fact, 16 rules were all he needed. In his book he also included some exercises and translations of literature. Finally, at the back he put his address, inviting readers to send him letters in the universal language. Ludwig was worried what people might think of the book. He had talked about his language with many friends, but he did not tell everyone. He was now a well-known eye doctor in Warsaw, and if he published it under his real name, it might damage his reputation. So instead, he put his name as Doctoro Esperanto. Esperanto, in the universal language, meant one who hopes. It took all of Clara's diary to pay for the publishing. 
The publisher did not like the idea, and told Ludwig he was wasting his money. But Ludwig didn't listen to him, and waited. At first, nothing happened. And then, a few weeks after he published the book, he received a letter. The letter was in Esperanto. I can't believe it. After reading this book, I can already read and write in your language. At first, I thought it was a silly idea, but now I truly believe it can change the world. Ludwig was excited. Clara, Clara. He cried, and showed her the letter. I've just read a first letter in my own language. She was just as happy as him, and they danced around the house. Soon, another letter arrived, and then another, until letters were coming every day. They were all written in the language, but they did not call it the universal language. Instead, they started calling the language Esperanto, because of the name Ludwig had given himself, Doctoro Esperanto. It makes sense, said Ludwig. It is a language of hope. And this success is more than I could hope for. So Ludwig got to work on a second book. Then other people started writing in the language. Some wrote magazines, some translated literature, some wrote poetry. Clubs started forming, where people spoke the language. Finally, in 1905, the First World Congress of Esperanto was held in Boulogne-sur-Mer, in France. 688 people came, and they all spoke the language together. Ludwig was happier than ever before. At the beginning of the Congress, he gave a speech. We must understand the importance of this day. Here, in the walls of Boulogne-sur-Mer, not Frenchmen with Englishmen, not Russians with Poles, but people with people have come together. Esperanto continued to grow. It went from an idea to a movement, and more and more clubs formed around the world. Ludwig's dream had become real. People were using the language to communicate across borders. He continued to work in the language, but he did not see himself as the owner. Rather, he was just a speaker, just like all the other Esperantists. Ludwig eventually fell under poor health. He died from a heart attack in World War I. His children continued his project, but not everyone loved Ludwig Zamenhof's message of peace. The Zamenhof family were Jewish, after all, and in World War II Hitler killed most of his family. He called Esperanto a secret language of Jews. After the two wars shook the world, there was little place for hope. But hope never dies out completely. Although it may not be the universal language, many still speak Esperanto today. It is nobody's language and everybody's language. And it all came from a young Jewish boy with a dream.